Great. Well, I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first ever TikTok. Uh, as the weather gets warmer, um, we begin to head back outside to garden, to hike, and to explore the incredible natural resources that we have uh, in the Hudson Valley and across the state. It's really important that we know what to look for, especially as it pertains to keeping ourselves and our pets safe. Uh, so we wanted to highlight today ticks. Uh, we are, have already heard so many stories uh, this year of people uh, finding ticks on themselves, on their kids, on their pets, that it's incredibly important, to, again, to know what to look for uh, so that we can enjoy the outdoors safe, as safely as possible. So today, I am joined by three incredible experts in ticks, tick-borne illnesses, and outdoor recreation who will each present some information. After the brief presentations, we will take questions, including a few questions that were submitted in advance uh, of this presentation. Uh, topics will be covered today include tick biology, tick ecology, how to tick check, and tick proof yourself, your family, and your pets. Tick-borne diseases, ca uh, different causes, the causes of tick-borne diseases, treatments, and effects. So today we are joined, as I said, with three incredible panelists. First, we have Kate O'Connor from Mountain Catskill Mountain Keeper. Kate graduated from SUNY ESF with a BS in environmental biology in December 2016. While in school, she worked for the Casanova Preservation Foundation and volunteered for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Following graduation, she worked for New York State Parks as a forest health specialist, monitoring for invasive pests, pathogens throughout Eastern New York. Currently, Kate is completing a special project in the Catskills, monitoring hemlock, woolly, otolgid. I definitely pronounced that wrong, so you will have to correct me in a moment. Uh, po those populations in the Beaverkill region in Sullivan County. We are also joined by John Thompson, a Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership Coordinator, or CRISP, from Catskill Center. John Thompson. Catskill Regional Invasive Species Project Coordinator from Catskill Center. He has worked as a field ecologist in the Catskills and Hudson Valley for the past 25 years. During that time, he's observed a significant increase in the population of ticks where he works and enjoys the outdoors. And we will be joined momentarily by Master Gardener Barbara Campbell, who is having some technical difficulties, uh, as we all have now with the need for broadband. Uh, Barbara is from the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County. Barbara has been a Master Gardener for 20 years. She is a retired teacher from New Paltz Central Schools. She became interested in ticks and has since become a local expert in the issue over 20 years ago, being hospitalized for several days for Lyme. So John, you will be first up, followed by uh, Barbara if she joins us and then Kate, but if Barbara's still having problems, Kate, you'll jump in and uh, we'll, we'll round out with Barbara. John, over to you. Okay, great. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. This one works. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I wanted to, I'm gonna talk about ticks 101. So the basics of ticks and one of those things that I'll talk about is what a tick is and the types of ticks that we have in New York State that are related to human diseases. Uh, so ticks are arachnids. Um, they're closely related to mites and spiders. Uh, they have four life stages uh, and they're shown, three of them are shown here for each of these species. They, they occur as eggs, larvae, nymphs, and adults. Uh, ticks are flattened and teardrop shaped. Uh, larval ticks have six legs. Uh, while the adult ticks and the nymphs have eight legs. And I'll show you, um, I'm showing you three tick species here, as I mentioned. On the left is the black-legged or deer tick. 
Uh, in the middle is the American dog or wood tick, and on the right is the lone star tick. So each of these uh, is showing um, the female as the largest picture um, of each of the species. Uh, so uh, black-legged ticks, the first one on the left, uh, the female has this reddish abdomen, and those are the smallest of the ticks, and their nymphs could be the size of a poppy seed, and they range in size to the adults of being up to a sesame seed. Um, then moving on to the right, the American dog or the wood tick, uh, that is a, a very common species that we have. It has um, a shield behind its head. And also I should mention that each of these ticks are shown uh, so that their heads and their mouth parts are on the top. Those are the parts that bite you. Um, the dog tick has a shield behind its head here. And then the lone star tick, the third tick on the right, uh, that has a spot in the middle of its back. Uh, so each of these are gonna vary in what they look like based on what life stage it's in. And um, you can, also, they'll vary by, by whether they're male or female. So uh, I think I can stop sharing that. Um, before you go outdoors, it's important to know where to expect ticks. Ticks live in grassy and brushy and woody areas. Uh, many people get ticks in their own backyards. Um, did that stop sharing? It, did that stop sharing? Yes. It did. Okay, yep. sorry. <laughs> um, you can, in order to prepare to go outdoors, uh, you could treat your clothes with a product called permethrin. Permethrin can treat boots, clothing, and camping gear, and it remains protective through several washings. Um, you can buy clothes that are pre-treated with permethrin, and that will last even a longer time. Uh, it's important when you're outside to avoid contacts in places that might have ticks, uh, and those would be those woody and brushy areas I mentioned. Also areas with high grass and leaf litter. Uh, and if you're walking along a trail, you should walk in the middle of that trail. Um, it, it, if you have an opportunity to walk on a shale trail, like a, a rail trail uh, or something that's paved, then you could avoid being in those uh, tick areas. Uh, and after you come indoors, if you have been in an area that has ticks, uh, you could uh, put your clothes in the dryer for 10 minutes on high heat. Uh, that would kill any ticks. Uh, you could also, one thing that I do often is, is I'll shower as soon as I get home. So I have a bag set up near the back door where I come in, take my clothes off, put them in that plastic bag so that ticks won't crawl out, go and take a shower. And, and when you're uh, when you take your clothes off getting ready for a shower, uh, it's a good opportunity to do a tick check and you could do it on your own using a mirror to, to see like the areas of the back of your head and your hair. Um, or often I'll ask my wife to, to look over parts that I can't see to look for areas that, that might have ticks. Also showering itself might help remove uh, ticks as, and has been shown to reduce the, the risk of getting Lyme disease. Um, so you should do a, a full body check, as I mentioned, looking under your arms, um, behind your ears, uh, any areas where you might have tight clothing, like your, your sock line or your waistline. Uh, those are areas where I've commonly gotten ticks in the past. And if you find a tick um, that is crawling on your, on your clothes or anything, you could kill it right away by putting it in alcohol or you could crush it. I often carry a Leatherman. Um, and, and I'll crush them if I find them crawling on me when I'm out. And if you get bit by a tick, um, you should pull it off with a pair of tweezers trying to get as close to the mouth parts as you can uh, and save it. And if you have flu-like symptoms within two weeks, it, you may be able to bring that tick into your doctor. It may help identify what's, what you were bitten by and, and also what that, uh, depending on what you were bitten by, uh, could help determine what disease you might have uh, if you're experiencing symptoms. So I'm going to pass it on to uh, Barbara. <laughs> well, 
That was quite, a, I don't know exactly what you said at the very beginning because I was a nervous wreck trying to go down with, we have tons <laughs> of computers in the house and I'm using my phone, which is a little silly, but I'm holding it and I'm using it and I'm with you all, which I'm really glad. Um, thank you, John. That sounded great. You're welcome. So my uh, part of this is to talk about the biology. And if I repeat anything John said, it's because I wasn't in yet. And the tick itself uh, is um, the uh, exotis. Uh, it's a hard tick, Exotis uh, scapularis, also known as the deer tick, which is not a name that's supposed to be used, or the black-legged tick. There are over 900 species of ticks in the world and 90 in the United States, so they're around all over the place. The life cycle of the um, black-legged tick is two to three years, and um, they only take three meals in their entire lifetime. They don't take any meal when they're an egg, they take one meal as a larva, one meal as a nymph, and one meal as an adult. And unfortunately, you might be one of those three meals. Ticks lay tons of eggs, thousands, and, um, but they don't fly, they don't jump, and they don't drop. They do something that's called questing, where they'll wrap their legs around a stalk of grass or some type of green or plant material, and then they put the front legs right out, like, come and get me. And they try to, uh, as soon as anybody or any human or any warm-blooded animal goes by, they're right there to latch on. And um, it's a complex disease that we get from these ticks. And um, it's a zoonotic disease, which is a disease that's transmitted from an animal to a human. If you happen to come upon a tick in the larval stage, which is the tiniest, tiniest thing, uh, it cannot give you Lyme disease, which is good to know, because they're not born with it. They don't get it from their parents. They don't get it in the egg. So the first meal that a tick gets, which is when it's a larva, it might get Lyme disease or it gets the uh, spirochetes. So if the very tiniest, tiniest tick bites you, it cannot have the disease yet. You would be lucky. Most of the disease is transmitted by the next size up, which is the nymph, which is still tiny. Um, and uh, because of the fact that it is small and often not seen on your body, and um, it's, you know, jumps, not to jump around, but it moves around. So the nymphs are the ones that we worry about the most. The adults can also give you Lyme disease if they got it as a nymph or as a larva. But um, they often move on to deer, but they can, if, if you happen to be bitten by an adult and it has gotten the spirochete in it, you can get Lyme disease. So the disease itself is a bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, and it's a spirochete, which is the same family of diseases as syphilis. Um, again, it's transmitted by an infected deer tick that has gotten that spirochete either as a larva or as a nymph from a mouse most likely, or a chipmunk, or even a deer, some other animal that was infected, it bites that animal, it gets a spirochete, and then if it bites you, you get it. Um, let's see. The bacteria, once it goes into the tick, thrives in the gut of that tick. And then when the tick goes for its next blood meal, the only thing a tick eats is blood. When it goes for its next blood meal, there's a process that goes on. And that process, luckily for us, can take up to or more than 24 hours. So you have some time, usually, hopefully, as a scientist, I never say 100% on anything, to get the tick off of you. Because what happens once it bites you, it digs in, and then it, it saliva goes back and forth in your skin, and it deadens the skin, almost like the dentist does when he gives you a shot. And then after a period of time, they start burrowing into the blood and they, their saliva gets mixed with your blood back and forth. And if they happen to have the bacteria in their saliva, it can be transmitted to you and you then are susceptible to Lyme disease. Um, once the tick bites you, and if it has infected you, 
with the spirochete uh, and you're going to have Lyme disease, your body sets up an unbelievable immune response. A lot of what I've studied about Lyme and red, all of a sudden now we're getting to be experts on diseases and transmission after all the COVID protocols going around. A lot of similarities in um, immune system response and happens with many, many diseases and Lyme disease is one of them. So you don't actually, what you're, the symptoms you have are not from the actual spirochete. It's from the immune response that your system sets up. And it, this could, um, could be, that's why there's so many varied symptoms, depending on what your body's doing to react to the Lyme. By the way, if I go over my time, just yell at me because I, uh, I know it's hard to get it all in in five minutes. Um, there are tests for Lyme. Uh, one is the ELISA test, which is an enzyme-linked immune absorbent assay. And there's the Western blot, which is the one I had when I had Lyme years and years ago. They test for the antibody response. There is no test for the actual spirochetes. And that's another problem because when you first develop this disease, you don't make antibodies. It takes a while, as it does with COVID, so that you may not be uh, testing positive for weeks. And so you may you know, think you don't have it. Now the days, though, the doctors, especially in the Hudson Valley, are very suspicious when someone comes in with any of the symptoms and they usually try to treat you right away. Uh, there are three stages of the disease, early local, early disseminated, and late. The first two are totally curable. And the third one is the one we hear about a lot when people are fighting all kinds of symptoms, sometimes years later. The first one is when you get that bullseye rash, 80% of the people do, and you get a fever and you feel crappy. And sometimes we the uh, Tick bit you, you get a little necrotic tissue. I looked like I had a black jelly bean pasted on my arm. Mm -hmm. And the treatment is doxycycline, 10 to 21 days. And I was told, consider yourself cured. And I did. I have. And the same thing with stage two, where you get into neurological symptoms and meningitis and palsy. And again, it can be cured sometimes with two doses of antibiotic and sometimes with IV antibiotic. Then we get to the late uh, stage. This is often called chronic Lyme, which they say is not a correct term. There's supposedly no disease with that term in the medical profession. But these people have more severe symptoms. They could have heart problems. They could have gastrointestinal problems. They could have neurological problems. And um, by this point, the uh, spirochete has finished its job and gone. So treating them with antibiotic is not going to do any good and repeated antibiotic. And of course, antibiotics, we all know, do all kinds of things to our system. But they're finding out now that they're having more success if they treat with antiarthritics, since a lot of the symptoms mimic or are like arthritis. Often arthritis drugs seem to help or even ibuprofen. Um, also, the other um, treatment the CDC is now recommending, and I've done this to myself when I've had ticks on me. If you find a tick on you actually embedded, the CDC recommendation is to take one 200 milligram dose of doxycycline as a prophylactic. And it seems to be working. And that's their recommendation. I know my daughter who's in the field thinks that's terrible because we're going to wind up with all of these um, bacteria that are going to be, uh, they're not even going to work the, the, for them because that happens too. But that is the recommended treatment at the moment. And Barbara, um, thank you so much. That's Sorry, it. That's okay. <laughs> no, that, that's a lot of really, really great information. <laughs> I want to um, give people a chance to, to digest that, give to Kate. And we are getting a bunch of questions in the chat, which I think okay. will, uh, which I think will come back to some of the things that you're talking about. So, okay. That sounds good. And also, um, I do have tons of information on the new vaccines that are under a study. So uh, if Kate doesn't mention them, I can talk about those. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't be mentioning them, so we'll go back to you, Barbara, um, but I'm excited to talk a little bit about tick ecology. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, I spent a long time crawling around the woods studying the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, and so I've had a lot of encounters with ticks in my life, so I'm excited to talk about their lives with you. 
Um, I've got some slides to share so you don't have to just look at me the whole time. Can everyone see my slideshow? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So um, let's see if it will go. Okay. So John did a great job oh. sort of uh, talking about the three most common ticks that we have in New York. Um, and so they have a, a range of time that it takes them to complete their life cycles, uh, anywhere from two months for a dog tick to upwards of two years for a deer tick. Um, but all of them- You, the, you wanna put your um, your slides into presentation mode? Oh, they, they are, are they not? Let's see. Uh, just down on the bottom, on the bottom right, you could click on the- so that we're just seeing one slide, if you want us to see that. Um, I'm, I do just want you to see one, but I'm not sure. Let me see. Um, it should be, on, if you go down to the bottom right, um, where there's the the zoom, just to the left of that, uh, if you click on that, you see where there's notes on the bottom? It says notes. If you're seeing the same slide. <laughs> <laughs> not seeing the same thing we can uh, we can see it but it, it's a little small yeah picture on the bottom mm -hmm. bar I, think it's what talking about. I see the share button um oh, it. it worked in the um let me see let me just try again. Any better? Yeah, but I think you can, we can just talk through it. I, yeah, I think it's fine, Kate. I think. Okay. Sorry about ahead. that. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working now. But There's no sun. So uh, anyway, John did a great job talking about um, the three species of ticks that we have in New York. Um, again, they take a, a variety of times to complete their life cycle. They're all three host feeders. Um, so they each need three hosts uh, to complete that life cycle. Um, and for a dog tick, that might just be three different dogs. For a deer tick, it might be a mouse, a deer, and a human. Um, but regardless of how long it takes them and what those hosts are, there are some common factors uh, that contribute to high tick populations. And that's really what I want to get into. Um, so the first uh, condition that favors high tick populations is high humidity. Uh, ticks don't drink water, um, but they absorb it from the atmosphere. And so um, things that impact humidity, obviously, aside from weather, are vegetation cover. And John mentioned uh, ticks in areas with high brushy vegetation or grassy areas, tall grasses. And what that does is create a microclimate uh, to promote humidity and, um, again, fosters tick populations. So. Uh, one thing that we're doing by um, not managing our forests um, it is uh, introducing this vegetation layer that's really fostering ticks. Um, another thing that contributes to their population are cumulative degree days. So um, not only does increased temperature promote their development, but we're seeing a lengthening of seasons, uh, growing seasons in the state. And what that does is give them a longer time to find the host. It increases that time that they can be questing, uh, like what Barbara said. So they have a, a better chance of finding a host because they have a longer time to do it. Uh, the next thing that influences their population is the abundance of hosts. So the more hosts that are out there for these ticks, uh, the more ticks that were, will survive. Um, there's some great research out of the Cary Institute that has shown that the white-footed mouse um, and not the deer uh, is the primary host of the, the Lyme tick or the black-legged tick. Um, not only are these hosts abundant, um, but they are a host that allows the ticks to survive um, very well. And unfortunately for us, they're huge reservoirs of the Lyme bacteria. Um, so that, that's an important factor in their ecology. Um, tied to the host numbers is our, our predators. And so I'm talking about predators of the ticks themselves directly, um, but also predators of those hosts that, that allow the ticks to survive. Um, so I've got my little stock image of an opossum uh, in the corner, if you can see it. I know my slides are small, um, but opossums are great 
Uh, they live in our backyards and um, they're like little Roombas. They go around and ticks get on them and they groom and remove over 95% of the ticks that land on them. So um, they're kind of strange looking, um, but they are really our allies in the fight against ticks and, and Lyme. Um, the other predators that I was referring to are not just the ones that eat the ticks, uh, but the ones that eat the tick hosts are also important and we're losing them. Uh, we're losing foxes and bobcats and owls uh, to development, to habitat fragmentation. Uh, these are creatures that need room. They need contiguous forest, and we keep building our houses on top of that. Um, so by conserving land and, and conserving larger pieces of forest, we can increase those predator populations that will suppress the host populations, very important, um, and also owls. Um, I know a lot of uh, uh, wildlife rehabbers, um, they're constantly getting owls that are victims of rodenticide poisoning. Um, so there are a lot of, of behaviors that we humans uh, can, can change uh, to sort of affect this tick population ecology um, by managing our vegetation um, and by, by promoting the predators of, of the tick hosts. Um, just briefly, I know I'm probably running out of time, um, but I wanted to talk about two really great projects working with tick ecology and human health uh, that are taking place right now in New York. The first one is Tick Blitz. This is a collaboration between uh, Cornell, uh, New York IPM, and the Northeast Regional Vector Borne Disease Center. They're looking to do a tick blitz in June. They're going to assess uh, tick populations through uh, citizen silence, citizen surveillance uh, samplings. Um, so they're gonna look at uh, where ticks are in New York, their northward expansion and their population levels. And they're particularly concerned with the Asian longhorn tick. And this picture here is, is a lone star tick, but the Asian longhorn tick is a new invasive species. Um, we've only had 16 individuals confirmed in New York, um, but they're concerned because they're parthenogenic which means like the hemlock woolly adelgid, the females can reproduce uh, without a mate, without a male. And so one tick can uh, start a founding population. Uh, their danger to humans is unknown. Um, in Asia, they're associated with thrombocytopenia uh, syndrome virus, um, but we're unsure uh, in New York uh, really a lot about their biology and their ecology. So part of, of tick blitz will be uh, finding out where they live and what their hosts are. Um, they have been linked to bovine filariosis disease in cattle. Um, so that could be a concern for, for New York um, livestock. The other project I just want to touch on briefly uh, is the tick project. And this is a five year uh, study that's wrapping up now by Cary Institute. And they're looking at neighborhood scale uh, methods of reducing tick encounters. Um, so they're using two intervention methods, um, a broadcast um, uh, fungi, basically. Uh, it's an entomopathogen that kills ticks um, and, and pretty much only ticks. There's not a lot of non-target effects um, and it's, it's not a, a synthetic chemical. Um, and they're also treating small rodents using bait traps, um, chipmunks and, and white mice with um, uh, a compound, what, what you would find in like Advantix or Frontline um, to inoculate them against ticks. Uh, so the results of that should be out later this year. You can go to the website if you're curious and you wanna support the project. Um, this is probably the, the greatest advance uh, in what we're looking at in terms of managing tick populations and reducing human tick encounters. So um, that that is the end of my... That's that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for everybody watching, you can see we have three incredible experts uh, in ticks here running the gamut uh, of information uh, that will be helpful for, for all of us. I know it's something that I always think about. You know, I went on a walk the other day just down my driveway to uh, to the street and to walk around and I wanted to cut through my yard and I decided to stay on my driveway instead because deer had just been there the day before and I was wearing black pants and it's hard to find ticks mm -hmm. uh, on anything black. So I know always to, wasn't the smartest choice to wear black to go for a walk outside uh, in this season. So always to wear light colored clothes. Uh, but I do, John, really like the uh, dryer tip to put all of your clothes mm -hmm. that you wear outside in the dryer for 10 minutes. That's a really easy, really quick way uh, to get at that. So I, I appreciate that. 
Um, we do have a couple of questions, which I will start fielding uh, to everyone. So the first question that we actually received ahead of time was um, this question. I have three indoor cats who are treated monthly with Catigo. If I pick up a tick, does my cat's protection mitigate my risks from the tick? No. <laughs> Barbara and John, you both say no. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they should take, they, when they should still take other precautions, of course, to, to do that. And what are some of the precautions, I guess, for, uh, for animals and for pets uh, that we have? Is there anything else that people are able to, to do? Uh, aside from topical treatments, I know that there is a vaccine for Lyme available uh, for dogs. Um, so that's one important way that you can protect your pet. Um, but just using topical products like Frontline or Advantex or flea collars um, is probably your best bet. It, it, and it would be good to, uh, when you do go out for a walk with your dog, uh, if the dog gets into long grass or a brush or something, to, to just check them for ticks and especially around the head and the ears and the collar mm -hmm. area um, to do a really thorough check to, to look for them because they can bring them back inside and then the tick is, uh, especially if they lay on your couch or your bed or something, then they, they could transfer that to you or, or any other pets that you have. I think about that a lot. My, my cat is an indoor outdoor cat and she's black and I definitely don't check her enough. And I was real, I was with her on the couch the other day and I realized that like, oh, I need to be much better about this going forward because you don't know and they could fall off anywhere and then they're just in the house, right? And that's not good for anybody. Uh, our next question is staying on the theme of pets. Uh, what would I do if my dog got a tick bite? Uh, and this person has never seen a tick. So what would you, what would you do uh, or what should they do uh, if their dog or pet got a tick bite? I know you talked about uh, a treatment, but should we go, you call the vet immediately? What kind of is the next course of action? Um, definitely consult a veterinarian. Um, and if you're able to save a tick, um, I don't know if the person was able to save the tick, but you can submit ticks for testing. Um, and tickencounters.org uh, has a great list of resources of places where you can send ticks to be tested for disease, um, which will help. That, that's great. And what would you do? This is a question I have actually. How do you save a tick, right? What do you put it in? Do you, what is there something that people should have on hand, or is there a household item that people that you can do to save one? If you have an extra medicine bottle. You could put it in that um, and with a little alcohol. It, it, and sometimes my wife or I, if we find one, we'll put it in just a little plastic bag, label it right. as to the date and right. things like that. Great. Um, here is another one. I know uh, someone had mentioned the 36 hours before. So confirming is the duration to withdraw the tick 36 hours before infection? Yes. And I, as I say, as a scientist, I'm not sure that's 100%. That's what they say. But I have heard people said they've gotten the disease, having the tick on less than 36 hours. Thank you. And we have another question. We've got great questions for this group. Thank you. It's a really very timely and important topic. So I'm, I'm very glad that we are doing this today. And thank you all for your time. Are there any supplements that you could take that would produce a skin odor or condition that would be a deterrent for ticks? Uh, this person has read that some B vitamins when taken regularly will help produce a skin odor that would repel mosquitoes. Is there something similar for ticks? That we know of. I don't think so. N not that I know of. <laughs> yeah. I, th they, they seem really um, aggressive to, <laughs> to be on you and bite you. <laughs> Right. Right. And I know, you know, there's a lot of talk, at least when I was growing up, you know, you, the way that you knew there was a tick uh, was a bullseye, right? That was kind of the, the information that you have. But I've heard a lot more that you don't necessarily need uh, that bullseye. And even the bullseye can look very different uh, depending, of course, I think possibly on the tick or when you get it or how long it's there. Is Are there certain outside of, I know we talked about 
flu-like symptoms about two weeks after you find one, but are there other specific markings or inflammation or anything that people should keep an eye out uh, for the days after they know they've been outside? Well, first of all, they say only 80%, well, it's a lot, but 80% get the bullseye. So 20% don't get anything. Um, you have to look for the fevers and, and headache or you know anything else that you think might be a symptom. I'm also getting feedback. I don't know if you're getting it, but I'm getting it. <laughs> we hear you. We hear you well. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. So, okay, so, but so most, I would say, you know, of course, as to Barbara, to quote you, you know, I, I'm not a scientist either. So uh, not to say and anything is uh, always 100%, but most people should see some type of almost like a flu-like symptom, either a fever or something like that. That is a pretty mm -hmm. standard reaction. Yes. That's your body's immune system fighting the uh, bacteria that's now in your bloodstream. That's helpful. See, I actually didn't know that. So that's really helpful for me, at least, and hopefully for anybody, uh, anybody watching. We have another question that says, are guinea fowls efficient predators against tick, uh, ticks, or is that just a myth? Um, I think that, that that's a question that I've seen come up at other tick talks. Mm -hmm. And um, the question is, what is an efficient predator? I mean, guinea fowl might eat ticks, but um, whether or not they eat ticks to the point where it's going to reduce your chances of encountering a tick in your backyard is a, is a question that I don't think anyone has answered. I wouldn't rely on my flock <laughs> of guinea fowls to protect me. I would, I would take some additional steps. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. And, and a couple um, other in the similar vein that we've had, uh, is there any validity to essential oils for an example, peppermint being a natural repellent. I do know that lemon eucalyptus oil, which is uh, an essential oil, is an EPA registered tick repellent, um, but I haven't heard anything about any others uh, like peppermint. Great, but you say that one again, lemon, which lemon, which one? Lemon eucalyptus, uh, which is different, it's not, lemon or eucalyptus together, it is a specific essential oil. Um, and you can find that on the EPA website. Great, thank you. Uh, and we have another one here, uh, back into the pet realm. You know, of course we all love our pets and wanna make sure that they are safe and protected. Do we know of any natural alternatives to frontline for dogs for tick bites? You know, we all see the frontline commercials uh, and I'm sure that's uh, what our vets are, are most commonly uh, prescribing uh, for outdoor animals, but do we know of anything that's natural that could replace that? Similar to the, the lemon eucalyptus. I don't know of anything for pets. Uh, you could Research try it, but it's to... not going to be effective as as the front line or other um, that you you know over the that you can get from your veterinarian. Um, again, dogs and cats don't live as long as we do, so they are they give them the same thing with heartworm. You know, minor poisons, but since they don't have this long life expectancy, it doesn't seem to have an effect on them. But it's still something to be wary of. Right. Yeah, it seems, you know, we know that there's a lot more research that needs to be done both around mm -hmm. uh, Lyme disease and around these kinds of preventative measures because uh, it's something, I mean, I we believe that my uncle uh, passed away from Lyme disease many years ago before it was uh, known. You know, it, it turns out that we've had, had all the symptoms and had all the reactions ahead of time, but nobody knew uh, yeah. years ago. And thankfully we're, we're getting, it, it's getting a lot more attention, but there's so much work still that needs to be done in this space. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's forums like this that spark ideas for people to do some of their own research and, and find, come up with really creative solutions. So, uh, there's definitely space in this, in this world, uh, to try to find some better creative, uh, repellents and help for, uh, for Lyme and for ticks. And I would like to mention the two vaccines that are on their way. And um, they, they had a vaccine back in 1998. It's on the market a couple of years and it was taken off. But there are two very promising ones. One's out of the University of Massachusetts and it's called PREP, 
pre-exposure prophylactic. It's a yearly shot that you would take in the spring before you would be out with the ticks. And um, it doesn't have as many side effects as other vaccines because it's giving you an antibody. It's not making your immune system make antibodies. And they started stage one um, trials uh, on, believe it or not, February 24th of this year, so it's brand new. They're doing it in the Midwest with 60 participants and they're doing it out there because they felt that in the um, East Coast there are too many people that have had Lyme or process of Lyme that it would skew their results. So they're going to a place where there aren't as many uh, Lyme diseased people. And they're expecting, if all goes well, that will be on the market in the spring of 2023. Sure. The other vaccine has been in the works for another couple of years and that's with of Valnueva and Pfizer, and it's VLA15. That can be given to both children and adults. They're in phase two trials right now with 600 people, and they are along the East Coast. And that is a regular vaccine, which will actually uh, in, pr induce your body to produce antibodies by giving a protein that's on the outer skin of the Borrelia or whatever. But um, both of those are promising. And you know, it looks to me like they've come a long way because up till now, we didn't have any hope of getting a, a vaccine. Right. No, that's really exciting news mm -hmm. uh, to have two on the horizon. Uh, right. That's great, especially as we have. I mean, we all know uh, not only do we have a uh, exploding deer population uh, that's happening all over our communities, but also so many more people who I think through COVID have really been reinvigorated to get back outside, yes. right? And to take advantage of the incredible natural resources that we have at our hiking trails and our swimming holes and our waterways uh, and just, and gardening. I mean, just being outside, breathing that fresh air. Uh, and uh, a lot of people, you know, may not, who haven't been doing that in a while, don't know a lot about uh, what to look for uh, and the kinds of challenges, especially as we have different people moving into more wooded areas, don't know what to look for. They haven't had lived in this life for a long time. And so uh, to be able to have those coming is, is really helpful and really up I'm optimistic about that. So uh, anything else, you know, I think we've covered a lot of really good information uh, here about both uh, Lyme disease and ticks and what to look for. Uh, what is the season? I, I'll actually ask, you know, when should you, other than all the time, right? Is there points of the year where you should be more attentive than others? I've heard you can get a tick at any month, any month of the year people have gotten ticks, but I personally noticed that May and June are the big times in, in New Pulse where I live. Uh, we regularly take ticks off. My husband takes them off and I take them off in May and June. That seems to be the big time. Great. And I'll ask too, you know, oftentimes I know, John, you were talking about this. If you get a tick, you want to make sure that you get as close to, with tweezers, you get as close to the head as possible. But oftentimes I know on my, I've had ticks myself, uh, specifically wood ticks that get so big that, you know, you, you kind of can take the body, but the head still is, is kind of, can get stuck. And so how important is it to make sure that you get the head of the tick too? Uh, it, it's really important because if you leave the mouth parts in, it could lead to other infections. It, it, it actually happened to me where I was, I was bitten in the thigh uh, where my wife removed the tick, but some of the mouth parts remained mm -hmm. in there. So I went to the doctor and he was able to remove it. Um, so that's something to look for and, and definitely uh, have a magnifier. Sometimes you need a flashlight, especially I'm old enough where my eyes are starting to deteriorate um, to, to make sure that you're getting it all out. Uh, that, that's really important. So, and it's really important when you first try to get it, that you try to get all the mouth parts out and get as, uh, as far down as you can. Usually what happens to me is uh, it'll swell up around where the tick is biting me. It, like Barbara was saying, it turns black sometimes. It's um, it, And so it's hard to get down in there, but you need to make sure that you do that to get the mouth parts out. Thank you. And I wanna lift up one comment that we've gotten. Sorry, Barbara, I wanna lift up one comment we've gotten in relation to the uh, seasonal aspect that says, if temperatures are above 39 degrees, 
ticks will become active again, which is why uh, there are so many issues with those midwinter thaws, right? Uh, and this is mm -hmm. from uh, a scientist who studies tick-borne diseases. So thank you for being here and for sharing uh, that information. That that's really important to to know and to confirm. We should anytime you're outside, always take precautions. Always check your pets when they come in from outside or you come in from a walk. Try to wear light-colored clothing, which finds it easier uh, for you to spot. Uh, and just always do that once-over uh, check, which is something that's important. Barbara, I'm yeah. sorry, add something? Not now. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, I've seen uh, in the end of February uh, near the Schoharie Reservoir, north of the Catskills, um, we were we got, we got were actually doing a woolly adulthood survey and we got ticks on us, uh, which was, that's the only time in the winter uh, where that's happened, where it had only been a few days since the snow melted, but the, the leaf litter was exposed and the, the ticks were out. So it's something to be careful for. Um, and I think most of the time for me, um, this time of year is when I end up bringing ticks in. I think because I'm not using, not necessarily, I don't have all my clothes treated with permethrin and things like that. So it's really important to be aware now uh, and, and, and start to uh, be prepared to go out. One of the things I do, I'll just add for clothes that aren't treated, um, is I use a lint roller on my clothes and that's really yes. great for removing those little nymph ticks that are difficult to see. Um, that's another option if you don't wanna treat all of your clothes. I'm gonna be involved in the tick blitz and we are using lint rollers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great tip too, and everybody has those around the house, especially if you have pets. So that, <laughs> <laughs> so that's an easy thing, easy thing to do. Lint roll your clothes and, and brush and check your pets when you come in. Uh, additional bonding time uh, with our furry friends. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say thank you all so much. We're about at time here, and I think we've gone through all of the questions uh, that have come through, and I think this has been really informative. I know I learned a lot. Uh, there's always more to discuss, but this this was really great. And you know, we want to make sure that people, as the weather gets warmer, and we've been inside all winter, and even before that, through uh, through the pandemic and through COVID, uh, as people get outside, and we are all itching to be outside as much as we can, we want to make sure people are being uh, at, taking as many precautions as they can, and being as safe and being as knowledgeable uh, as they can be about the things that they face, uh, and being able to be safe outdoors. So I thank you all so much for joining us and lending your expertise you. uh, and your experiences. Uh, thanks for being here. And I, we will we'll do it, definitely do it again because there's always much more to talk about as it comes to uh, <laughs> Lyme and ticks. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everyone.